Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours, the uh, travel company that relies on reporters around the world. And today we are discussing Tunisia. Now, in 2011, as you may remember, Tunisia basically began the Arab Spring and ended for its own country 23 years of dictatorship, but also triggered off something for the region as a whole. It's fair to say that the Arab Spring has largely failed in many countries, and we'll ask what happened to it in Tunisia. At the time, an Islamist party, uh, Inada, won elections, but uh, uh, having formed a coalition with secular parties, didn't last long and were uh, quite soon out of power voluntarily. So it's all quite intriguing what happened, and there's been a lot of political instability since then. And to discuss it, we've got Monica Marx, who is very familiar with Tunisia, lived there a long time, currently in Abu Dhabi with New York University, studied at uh, Harvard, and I can see from her shirt, my old college, St. Anthony's at Oxford. Uh, so welcome to you, Monica. Thank you, Owen. Lovely to be with you. And no H in Antonis. I'm glad to see you've got the shirt right. Uh, Indeed. So, yeah. uh, we're going to talk um, just for a few minutes and then we'll ask people to, to uh, put questions to you. But first of all, can you just remind us why it was that Tunisia was the place where the Arab Spring began? So a lot of scholars of Tunisia, not that there were so many, you know, there were just really a handful of us who'd worked on the country before the revolution. They often talked about the Tunisian paradox. In other words, why was it that Tunisia was such a comparatively educated country with no real ethnic cleavages to speak of, a very homogenous population, 99% Sunni Muslim, um, Pretty, pretty good uh, level of development, not a huge amount of income inequality, no history of a meddling coup-prone military like so many countries in the Middle East and North Africa. So despite all of these quite auspicious factors for democratization, Tunisia um, until 2011 was a deeply repressive police state. It was the sort of country where you'd check to see if the walls had ears before you talked politics. You, you wanted to be in, the, in a moving car with the windows up to talk politics. Um, so a lot of people were, were a bit um, stupefied by that. And we weren't surprised when the Arab Spring revolutions began in Tunisia for those reasons. And if there was one country in the Arab world that was going to democratize first, everyone really who was knowledgeable thought that it would be Tunisia. And that, that factor I mentioned about not having a coup-prone military, we really can't overestimate how important that was. Because when Tunisians came out onto the streets to demonstrate and overthrow their dictatorship of 23 years in December 2010 and January 2011, thereby kickstarting the so-called Arab Spring, um, they didn't have a military with, with teeth to be able to step in and put the kibosh on that. Instead, the military really stood back and let civilians change civilian dictatorship leadership the way they wanted to. And that was great. But of course, now... 13 years on, we find ourselves in a, in a very different and extremely depressing place today. Before we get there, just remind us what happened to Ben Ali, the dictator. Yeah, so Ben Ali um, had ruled Tunisia with an iron fist for 23 years. Um, until December 2011, uh, the cracks in his regime uh, became extremely apparent. Um, there was a young fruit seller, a 26-year-old guy in a hard scrabble small town with nothing to do in the middle of Tunisia, who made his living with a little fruit cart. And a police officer had come up to him and said, you don't have the right permits to be selling your fruits and vegetables. And that was his, you know, he was really on his last string, so to speak. Um, and he went out, he bought a can of petrol, he walked in front of the local courthouse, and he set himself on fire in an act of protest. His name was Mohamed Bouazizi, and his self-immolation was neither the first nor the last self-immolation and political protest in Tunisia, but it was the one that, not to not to use a pun here, but sparked the Arab Spring, literally. Um, and thousands and thousands of people, including the trade union, which is the most powerful in the Arab world in Tunisia, started to demonstrate all over the country. And within a month and a half, Ben Ali was on a plane to Saudi Arabia, which gave him political refuge. And there was a change in leadership. And Tunisians kept on demonstrating to make sure that it wasn't just um, old Bucha, Bucha's the Tunisian liquor in new bottles. You know, they, they wanted a full revolution and they got one. Um, but of course, delivering the political economy changes 
to make average Tunisians feel the fruits of the revolution proved very difficult for a decade, which left the country vulnerable to re-authoritarianization, which is exactly what happened 10 years later. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, never really got a chance at power. Uh, but mm -hmm. a, a party that some consider an equivalent, um, Inada in Tunisia, did get a chance at power through electoral victory. And it was led yep. by a fascinating man, Ganushi, who, who, you know, was was interesting. He'd lived in London many years, hadn't he? And he, he had some quite distinctive views uh, alongside his religiosity. Yeah, so I think most of your listeners will probably have heard of the Muslim Brotherhood. And many people are under the misperception that the Muslim Brotherhood operates in the Middle East almost like McDonald's franchises. <laughs> and that Islamist parties around the region are just the local chain of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, which started in 1928 and is kind of the mothership. And that's wrong. In Tunisia, the cousin-like movement I call it a cousin-like movement because it's very independent and different from the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in key ways. It's called Anatha, which means the Renaissance Party. And it started in the 1970s, a couple generations after the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood got started, with the guy that you just mentioned, Raja Ghanoushi, and a few of his contemporaries who were all in their teens and 20s. And we're talking about how Islam can help inform smart political critiques of dictatorship back in the 1970s. And Anath is really different from the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in some key ways, even though they initially took quite a bit of inspiration from it. For example, they never segregated women into their own wing. Women were always part of the movement, even though it struggled patriarchy, like Tunisian secular parties have too. Um, and, and a core part of its identity, unlike the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, was opposing dictatorship. And it was always a more vibrant democratic space internally and a much less sex segregated space internally, and honestly, a much less Islamist place internally than the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. In the London years, when Hanoushi was in exile under Ben Ali, because Ben Ali didn't want any political competition. So in the 1990s, especially, um, my supervisor at Oxford, Michael Willis, who was a North Africanist who ended up supervising my PhD, he would often go to these meetings with all of these different Arab Islamist groups in London just to watch and observe and, and report and analyze. And he often said that, um, you know, Hanushi would get um, decried as a non-Islamist sellout <laughs> by other Islamists across the region who had ended up in London as those day in those days. And that's not at all surprising. He's still often decried as a sellout, even though um, a lot of regimes in the region want to paint the Muslim Brotherhood as a, as a radical extremist monolith. Um, it's certainly not. And and the most moderate of all of its cousin-like movements, the most moderate pro-democracy movement in the Islamist space in the entire Arab region was Tunisia's Anatha. A lot of its leaders suffered um, torture. They suffered rape as a system systemic weapon of um, regime political oppression in the 90s and 2000s and even earlier. Um, and they were, were free and they got into exile and they came back in 2011 to lead the democracy. But now... Ten years on, when a coup returned it to dictatorship, they got thrown back in prison. And Renouchi right now is languishing in a prison cell again, which is not just a travesty, but I think it's very it's a very dangerous signal when the most moderate Islamist party made so many concessions, did so many things intelligently, and and is still languishing in prison. That gives a message to a lot of real extremists who use violence in the region that playing the democratic game, being a moderate, making all these compromises, it will amount to nothing. So let's embrace jihadism or let's embrace violence. It's very dangerous. It is a very sad story, isn't it? And I should just say, if anyone wants to ask questions, then uh, you're very much encouraged to do so. I'll see you come up in the Q&A box and I'll use my technical mastery, such as it is, to uh, get your get get your voice into this conversation. So please do ask questions as we go along. But it is, it is upsetting, this story you're telling, because Inada were unusual. And he he was uh, and is an interesting guy, this uh, Ganushi, who did try. He really tried, as you say, to to do it by the democratic rules, and and even gave up power. You know, uh, in a way that very few people in in the world do. Never mind in the Middle East. Uh, and w when he came under pressure, he you know he, his government fell and he accepted it. Uh, so it 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 is, you know, uh, 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 it was a place of great hope for those who saw the Arab Spring as a way of uh, bringing Islamists to power in, in, a, in a democratic framework, but it, it just didn't work out. 
Yeah, you know, I, I'm an American citizen, and I've, I've sometimes wished that our Republican Party was as relaxed about religion as the Tunisian so-called Islamists were. Um, you know, as a secularly oriented person, I, I wouldn't have been voting for them in Tunisia. But they often took positions that were more um, socially progressive on issues like criminalization of homosexuality, for example, than their so-called anti-Islamist or, or secular competitor parties. So, for example, on decriminalization of homosexuality, the main anti-Islamist party during Tunisia's democratic decade from 2011 to 2021 said, we won't decriminalize it over our dead bodies, basically. That's what Sebzi, its leader, said, whereas Renouchi, the so-called Islamist, said, don't ask, don't tell. Now, in, in my view as a social liberal, neither one of those go far enough for me, but don't ask, don't tell is a lot better than, than keeping it criminalized. And there are a number of issues like that where Anatha got slapped with the Islamist label, but really was was quite chill. They looked up to the German Democrat, uh, German Christian Democrats in a lot of ways, and and they actually re renounced the Islamist label. They said it was like an Orientalist label um, that that mischaracterized them, and so they, you know, they really, really did try, and and they have not been rewarded for it. And Tunisian democracy collapsed partially as as a result of the inability to normalize their integration in the political space because for decades before 2011 under dictatorship they have been so demonized um, and so persecuted it prompts an interesting thought because you know there is this idea out there that islam and democracy are not compatible and you know that argument has been made uh, many times but particularly in the states probably now in this case it was almost as if the islamists were the democrats uh, and and others were stopping them i mean it, it's 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 a reverse yeah, it's, of it's not the same it's not exactly. I mean, it, and it took me so much fieldwork in Tunisia, I think, to to allow my mind to get out of that pre-programmed bubble where I had expected that all the main threats to democracy were going to come from the so-called Islamists. That's not to say they were perfect. Um, they often got the messaging wrong. They didn't push... Um, I'd say revolutionary reforms far enough when it came to battling corruption and delivering on the economy and creating a Supreme Court that would then enforce the new democratic constitution and blah, blah, blah. You know, so they made a lot of missteps. These people aren't saints. <laughs> but but they're they're not the the jihadist boogeymen um, or the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood or, or anti-Semitic boogeymen that they were often um, made out to be by authoritarian regimes elsewhere in the region and by some of their own critics on the left at home. Um, and, and Tunisian democracy really did suffer suffer as a result. Um, not enough people accepted democracy as the only game in town. Um, they they looked to other coup prone regimes in the region with hope that coups might be a way of silencing their competitors. And some people on the left did that, unfortunately, and ended up burning the whole house down in the process. Now, I'm going to uh, try and help Howard come online, which I'm sort of failing to do because I'm hopeless at the technology. But I'm just going to read his question. He's saying, um, Wikipedia, sorry, but I know a little about Tunisia, describe the system as a hybrid regime, neither autocracy or democracy. So I think that takes us forward to what happened after Inada. Can you talk us through, because they, they left power quite, so the Arab Spring kicking off with that fruit seller 2011, Inada comes mm -hmm. back to give up power in 2013? Yeah, they gave up power in 2013. So Anatha had led a three-party coalition, um, parliamentary government, democratically elected, um, with two so-called secular parties. They had a plurality, but not, not a majority. So they went into coalition with two so-called secular parties from 2011 to 2013. There were a lot of protests. Um, and they ended up giving power to a technocratic government in 2014 um, after shepherding the Tunisia's first democratic constitution into passing by about 98% of votes, almost unanimous votes, after a lot of vibrant debates. Um, there were three free and fair democratic elections in Tunisia during its democratic decade, the first in 2011, the second in 2014, and the third in 2019. Now, the last democratic election in Tunisia brought to power an anti-system populist outsider who was more Islamist than the Islamist in a lot of ways. He's Tunisia's current president. His name is Pius Syed. Ironically, he was an adjunct law professor and he didn't have a political party and people didn't think that he was going to be a real threat to the system, but he was. He was democratically elected, but two years into his term, he decided to close Tunisia's democratically elected parliament with army tanks. And then he proceeded to ban um, a lot of competitors, including just 
average business people who he accused of corruption without any due process from traveling anywhere. So he shut the parliament. He banned a lot of people from traveling. He shut down a lot of political parties in 2021, 2022. And that's the regime we're currently in, where a president who was initially elected democratically shut parliament and has been ruling by decree with zero checks and balances, zero oversight, entirely through fiat since his what we what we in political science call a presidential coup um, in 2021. So you know, I think it, it often takes Wikipedia and it often takes the labelers time to catch up with a new situation. Um, some people are calling Tunisia a hybrid regime because they're not sure how to explain that we have an authoritarian president ruling through decree by fiat who was initially democratically elected. What I would call Tunisia right now is an authoritarian system. I, I, I don't even really think it's on its way to becoming one. I think it's a consolidated authoritarian system now. Why? Um, because the president took over, uh, obliterated any semblance of independence of the courts. Um, he has, across the ideological spectrum, imprisoned all of his main competitors, not just the so-called Islamists, not just Anatha, but but trade unionists, um, radically anti-Islamist, radically so-called secular old regime supporters, anybody who, who sticks their head above the parapet. Every time I go back to Tunisia now, um, as a professor who's worked on the country for 13 years, I always go with the knowledge that it might be my last trip or that I might not get out. Um, Tunisia has become a very foreboding place. Right. And and how, just to say, on hybrid regimes, I mean, the, the place I'm familiar with, Pakistan, is often described as a hybrid regime and, and probably sort of is because the military are in charge, but there's a democratic element, it's contested, they fight each other, they, they, they fight for political space. And, you know, the army tends to have the upper hand, but, you know, sometimes uh, popular legitimacy, you know, makes a difference. So, that, you know, that is a sort of mixed system. Um, but Tunisia, you're describing really isn't. Uh, just to say, I've worked out how to bring people on air. If uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, I can now manage to uh, to do that uh, in that way. And I think actually we've got one from Howard. So Howard, I'm going to try and uh, help you uh, speak. So now, Howard, can you can you ask your question? Uh, thanks, Owen, and congratulations on mastering the technology, even without <laughs> the assistance of, of, of Karen. So, so given where, where, where we are, is it then correct to say that unless there is some other coup or something else uh, like that happens, there is no really further prospect for, for democracy and no expectation of further elections, unless for some reason the president decides, hey, uh, I've had enough of this, um, I'm confident enough that I think I would win elections or I'm under pressure from the international system, that unless the current president decides that actually we will go back to some sort of system, democracy is over for the moment. Yeah, democracy is over for the moment. But if the Arab Spring of 2011 teaches us one thing, it should be to never say never. Um, politics are deeply contingent and can surprise the hell out of you. <laughs> um, so, so he could, you know, he could die. He could have a, com a complete shocking change of heart. People could do another Arab Spring uprising. There could be a kind of internal coup where a lot of the power brokers in Tunisia decide that he's sending the, the country and its economy over a cliff. A lot of things could happen. But right now, I um, I'm not terribly hopeful. I think Tunisia is in a pretty exhausted, cynical space. When you travel around the country, a lot of people will sound like this. They'll tell you, we tried. Listen, we, we had dictatorship under Bourguiba and Ben Ali. And then in 2011, we tried democracy, but we've kind of been there and we've done that. And democracy didn't work out so well for us. And it didn't change our economy in ways that we really benefited from. And now we're seeing where Kaya Saya goes. And a lot of people just sound exhausted and cynical and hopeless. And Saya benefits from that. Um, a lot of people, including myself, are surprised that his new dictatorship has lasted as long as it has, because he is almost singularly um, ungifted at creating stakeholdership. There are a lot of different flavors of authoritarianism, of course. Some are enlightened despotism. Some really deliver on economic reform, even though they're bloody and oppressive. Think of Pinochet's Chile or think of um, some of the Gulf states like the United Arab Emirates, where I live. Um, 
people are doing pretty, pretty well, even though there's no real political rights or political freedom. And there's a lot of oppression in that space. But you have a lot of lifestyle liberalism and you have a lot of um, economic development. That's not Kaya Saeed's Tunisia. He's a kind of Gaddafi-esque. If you're familiar with the Libyan dictator from like the 70s and 80s, he, he has that sort of model. He's a little bit Stalinist in some ways. He's also like an old Arab grandpa from like the Arab nationalist 1960s, where he says a bunch of patriarchal and kind of Islamist stuff, more Islamist than the, than the Islamist, but nobody calls him an Islamist. And he's, he's really been driving the economy over a cliff. So now if you drive around Tunisia, you'll not be able to find in any grocery store from the ones that the diplomats' wives shop at in Tunis to the ones on the Libyan border, you won't be able to often find basic items like flour or sugar. When I travel to Tunisia now, I feel like I'm part of the World Food Program. <laughs> I go shopping in Dubai at home and I pack up my bags with whatever basic item people can't get. So there's a lot of political economy cracks in his regime and a lot of people, a lot of people, including power brokers, the remaining ones who've basically been defanged, including people in the military, people in the Ministry of Interior, a lot of people think that he's mentally amiss. A lot of people think that he has some screws loose, and they're very, very concerned. But he's benefiting from this exhaustion and the cynicism and this widespread feeling amongst Tunisians that they, quote unquote, tried democracy. Now, if you talk to a comparative political scientist who studies democratization, we're like, oh, we had it for 10 years. I mean, that's like barely enough time to get a whiff of this stuff. You know, it, it, this is a long journey and there's no such thing as ideal democracy and you can lose it at any minute. Think of January 6th in the United States, the Capitol riot. It's always vulnerable. But but that's pol pol perception is often reality in politics. And that's how a lot of Tunisians feel. Can I just ask you about some of the, the divides in Tunisian society? Because um, it, it struck me when I was there in, in this period when Anada were in charge, that there were... The First of all, there were big religious divides between that another quite you know, so-called moderate uh, political Islam and a significant number of violent jihadists. I mean, it's the only place I ever met, and it was quite a frightening experience, a, a serving member of Islamic State who uh, freaked me out somewhat, I have to say. And he was, he was um, a Tun young Tunisian lad who'd just come back from Syria. Uh, so the, there is that violent jihadist element alongside the religious Enada Muslim Brotherhood style element, and a lot of very secular Tunisians. It's quite a big divide, isn't it? Yeah, I think one of the trickiest things about understanding politics in Tunisia and in a lot of countries in the Middle East, to be honest with you, um, as a Westerner, is figuring out who's secular and who's Islamist. Mm. Because it's a big polarizing divide. But the people that we think of as secular or Islamists often aren't, and oftentimes it's backwards. <laughs> so sometimes the Islamist will be more secular than the secularist in that they're for freedom of religion in the public space. Sometimes that was certainly the case in Tunisia, and sometimes the secularists can be just as in favor of the state monopolizing religion and controlling it from the top down, or even more so than the Islamist. It can be very, very confusing. Uh, Tunisia is definitely like that. But to get to your point about jihadism, um, in 2011, the Arab Spring revolutions, which started in Tunisia, went to Syria. And by the time the wave hit Syria, the authoritarian regimes had watched and learned. And they said, we're not going to run away and get on a plane to Saudi like Ben Ali did in Tunisia. We're going to fight this democracy crap. <laughs> and that's what happened in Syria. Syria became extremely bloody. It became, you know, Assad, the leader, basically said, it's, it's me or the country. I'm going to burn this place down. And what started off as a peaceful pro-democracy uprising became um, ground zero for the new global jihad. And it became an environment where the violent nutcases dominated on, on both sides. It became very, very bloody. And Tunisia ended up sending, not from the top down, but a lot of young Tunisians ended up getting inspired by that and said, I'm going to go help my Muslim brothers and sisters fight Assad's bloody crackdown. And that was very dangerous for Tunisia. To, to have its democratic 
transition coincide with the new global jihad was very destabilizing because some of these radical jihadists got it in their heads that they wanted to uh, hijack Tunisia's transition. And these people hated Anatha. And Anatha for them was the moderate sellout how dare anybody call you Islamist? How dare you call yourselves Muslim party of grandpas that wanted to play the democratic moderate game? And these were young people who wanted to burn the house down and thought that um, the country should be a theocracy ruled straight from the Quran. There shouldn't be elections. Um, and they and they made terrorist attacks in Tunisia. There were terrible terrorist attacks. As a Brit, you might remember the, the attack on the hotels in Sousse in 2015. And as the so-called Islamist party in government Throughout that entire 10-year um, democratic decade, Anatha had some representation in government. It was really the only party well-organized enough to stay around. It often got blamed, just as you might blame, like think about blaming Mitt Romney, you know, like a moderate like Mitt Romney in U.S. Republican politics when an abortion clinic gets bombed. Complete, Mitt Romney is a completely different type of character than the sort of Christian theocrat who's going to bomb an abortion clinic. But sometimes people might lump them together, and and that's that's what happened. You know, I I I think Anatha didn't understand the jihadist threat that it was dealing with fast enough in 2011, 2012. They ended up learning a little bit too late, but they that was another brush used to tar them. And it was just deeply unfortunate for Tunisia's transition that it coincided with this regional jihad, and and Libya next door also became a total basket case and a jihadist training and recruitment ground, and Tunisia was attacked. In like 2016, entire towns were attacked by jihadists who trained in Libya next door. Let me just encourage some questions again. I can see if you ask a question in the Q&A uh, area, I will be able to. You could also just raise a hand and I will be able to bring you into this conversation. We're with Monica Marx uh, talking about Tunisia. And uh, another divide in Tunisian society that was glaringly apparent to me was the class divide. Because on the one hand, you had, you know, this poor chap who was trying to sell his fruit and some policeman came and said, you don't have the right paperwork even for that. And he and he just snapped. Uh, so desperate sort of situation. Uh, and at the other end, you've got this elite who lived the life. I remember going to a rave in an old church, was it, or a cathedral or something like that? And it was just like being in the most fashionable area of Paris. You know, it was unbelievable. Uh, the clothing and the wealth and the drugs and all the rest of it. So it, it it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a sort of shocking shocking aspect of tunisian society absolutely i remember going to protest in tunis um in front of the the government offices which were then democratic during that democratic decade from 2011 to 2021 where these unemployed young men would come and they they had literally sewn their mouths shut mm. as a way of just showing how desperate they were they took like this big black twine and i actually had i mean there were horrible things. There, there were multiple self-immolations in the style of Boazizi from unemployed youth. There's a degree of hard scrabble living and extreme desperation um, that's hard hard for people in the nicer cities to grasp. Um, there's a lot of Tunisians getting on boats to go to Europe. And, and these are the sorts of young Tunisians who, who feel just zero employment prospects. And but I think a lot of Tunisians, when they made their uprising for democracy in 2011, they were chanting on the streets, democratia, democracy, horia, freedom, but they were also chanting karama, respect. And for them, that often meant being able to put food on the table and sustain themselves and their families in a way that that young fruit seller couldn't, who committed suicide. And they thought that all those things would come together because the only democracies they knew were like France the old colonizer and the United States, which were all doing very well economically compared to Tunisia. And so a lot of people learned the hard way that you can have political democracy and freedom of expression and still be just as poor as you were when you started. There's often what political scientists call a J-curve after revolutions, where things get a lot worse economically before they get better, in part because of the instability and the regime transition, and et cetera, the learning curve. And that's exactly what happened in Tunisia and, and people grew impatient and it made the whole system vulnerable. And the politicians stopped pushing reform, um, especially economically, because making economic reforms is hard. You have to bring the trade unionists along on the extreme left. You have to bring the employers along. You have to go after corruption in a, in a dictatorship system that had been deeply corrupt. You have to piss off a lot of interest and few of these elected parties felt like they could or or would 
um, bite that bullet. And so things stagnated and got paralyzed and that made it vulnerable to um, a populist coup, which is what happened in 2021. T tell us about the other end of it, though, the elite, um, the people, those young, very fashionable Tunisians I saw raving the night away. Uh, they, I mean, they, they travel, they're international. Uh, and And what is their attitude to Tunisia? I mean, have they any care for... Uh, democracy for the impoverished, or are they just living in their bubble? Well, I mean, I think in any society, there are bubbled off people in any society. Um, there's always economic inequality. And if you look at your richest of the rich and their children and how they live their lives, they're often very cosmopolitan. They're the sort of people who will have uh, multiple languages, multiple passports. Their families will own big business conglomerates in the country and have a lot of lobbying power to make the politicians, even in a democracy, do what they want. Um, and if if things go, you know, we say tits up in the country politically, you know, it's, it sucks. It sucks for the people in the country, but you have your plan B, C, D, E, and F lined up. And, and that's certainly how it is in Tunisia. There's that small privileged elite um, that can pack up and go. Um, but, you know, one of the things that surprised me about Kaya Syed, the, the current president, after he made his, his presidential coup, is that he managed to even piss some of these people off because um, he's he's Im implemented these um, surprising populist policies in, in ways that um, even they didn't see coming, but in, in, in an ineffective way that hasn't delivered for poor people yet. So a lot of your money, most moneyed Tunisians, the sorts of people who are in the employers union and like the 12 families that own a lot of the business conglomerates in Tunisia, they've been siphoning money outside of Tunisia now for the past few years since the coup, because they're deeply afraid about the instability and the inefficacy of Syed's new dictatorship. It's not that they're opposed to dictatorship. They learned how to live under it, most of them very, very well under Bourguiba and Ben Ali. They, they learned how to work that system. And in fact, some of them were pro-coup and anti-democracy, not all, but some. Um, but they hate this ineffective, nutty style of Gaddafi-flavored dictatorship that Syed has brought. So there's been a, a lot of capital flight, and that's an underreported phenomenon in Tunisia. Uh, just one question before I do uh, ask for questions from, from uh, the, the listeners is I, one, one thing that struck me about Tunisia was the role of women there. And it was, it was very striking to me, and I, I never really understood it, but they just seemed to be much more out there and involved in life and uh, had just much more presence in Tunisian daily life. Uh, there were strong women uh, in public life and uh, out on the streets and so on. Why did that happen, particularly in Tunisia? And do you agree that with the observation? Oh, that? absolutely. Absolutely. And if there were Tunisians, especially Tunisian ladies listening to us right now, Oh, they would be smiling, they would be laughing, they'd be loving it, because this is a really core part of Tunisian identity. Um, there's this spicy paste that they make in Tunisia called harissa. And and some Tunisians will say, our women, you know, we, we're harissa spiced here. It, you know, if you want to, the, the farthest back I could trace it, it's hard because it's a cultural thing and it's difficult to do a cultural genealogy of of women's empowerment in Tunisia. But in 1956, Tunisia got its independence from France and it became an enlightened dictatorship under an enlightened despot named Habib Bourguiba. And Bourguiba was a Sorbonne educated lawyer. He was not a kind of Nasserite Egyptian army guy personality. He was an urban elite. And he had a French girlfriend out of wedlock in his youth and brought her back to Tunisia. And, and he was sort of in the model of an Ataturk type character for listeners who are more familiar with Turkey a generation prior to the 1950s. And he passed through basically strong arming religious conservatives. He passed something called the 1956 Personal Status Code, which was and remains, sadly, um, about the most progressive piece of gender legislation in the Arab world. It gave women the right to initiate divorce and it made polygamy illegal. Now, a lot of people thought that that was un-Islamic because according to the Quranic sources, men can have up to four wives and they're supposed to treat them equally and that's damn near impossible. But, but that's the way it typically is looked at by religious conservatives. But Tunisia hasn't had that since, the since 1956. And it's, you know, it's still struggled like every place with a lot of patriarchy, um, lack of participation for women in politics, et cetera. 
but it's it's a much more um, co-educational society. Girls and boys are educated next to each other. Um, the 1950s and 60s saw um, education rolled out popularly, and it's a much more legally egalitarian society than most of its neighbors. That's not to say that it's Sweden. It's certainly not. And women suffer a lot of problems there too. But it does have that different identity. And that, that also factors into why the so-called Islamist party, Anatha, which started in the 1970s and is very different from the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in a lot of ways, why they always included women. They they swam in different cultural waters. Tunisians, Tunisian gender politics start basically at the very left of Egypt. That's that's like the most right in Tunisia is often the most left in Egypt. The whole thing is translated in a more progressive direction in Tunisia than in a lot of surrounding countries. Yes, it is. It is. It's and, and it, 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 yes, yeah, so it's an interesting place, and that's why it's quite depressing what you're telling us that it hasn't worked out. You know, because it does have a lot. It didn't seem to have a lot going for it. It, it has a lot going for it, and it, and it still does. And you know, yeah. you. Just what have about, to, to hope. Uh, his, yeah. Historical sort of quirk. As, as, I think I'm right in saying the PLO were based there, weren't they? Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell us about why that happened, what they were doing there, and what that has meant for Tunisian attitudes to uh, Gaza and so on. Because I think they are, you know, quite strongly pro-Palestinian. I mean, a lot of lot of Middle Eastern countries are obviously, but you know, more so than others, maybe. Tell us about that. So. I need to refresh. I need to do what your listeners are doing. Get on the hop on the PLO history Wikipedia page here to re remember exactly what brought them to Tunis. But in the there was like four a four year period in the late in the, in the mid nineteen eighties when they were based in Tunis, yeah. and there were Israeli uh, Mossad attacks against Mossad. Uh, sorry, against uh, the PLO when they were in Tunis. Uh, so there were. Um, PLO operatives that were assassinated by the Israelis and their compound was bombed in Tunis. And, you know, a lot of people who are my age in their 30s now, they their parents remember that. Even if they don't remember it and live through it, their parents certainly did. And that was one factor that gave Tunisians a very strong tie to the Palestinian issue, but it's not the only one. I would agree with you, Owen, when you say that Tunisians are um, much more unconditionally, unflinchingly pro-Palestinian resistance, whatever that means, than a lot of other Arabs in the region. My my partner is half Palestinian, and I often laugh when I compare the conversations that I have with him, which are very critical of him, um, and very concerned about October 7th um, and, and the moral and legal rights violations that it entailed than I have with my Tunisian friends who are much further away from Palestine and know a lot less about it. And I think one of the main reasons for that, um, for why Tunisians and Algerians tend to be pro resistance, whatever it is, and if you if you question or critique that, you're a colonialist or you're selling the resistance down the river, I think it's because they see it through the lens of Algeria and how Algeria was decolonized. And they think that Israel-Palestine can follow the Algeria model. In other words, Algeria was settled and colonized by France and was literally part of France politically until the War of Independence liberated in the 1960s. And the French people simply went home. They simply went back to France <laughs> and because and, they were all part of the same country. And there's a misperception that a lot of Tunisians have, I think, that Israelis will simply go home, <laughs> even you know, even though going back to Europe often means going back to places where they were they were terribly persecuted historically, and that's not going to happen. That's how a lot of people see it. Mm -hmm. And just what is the relationship with uh, with France today? Is France, you know, does it consider Tunisia in its sort of sphere of interest? Um, the relationship between Tunisia and France. Yeah. Yeah. Um, France is Tunisia's closest trading partner. So the formerly French colonies of North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia especially, are the least trade integrated region in the world. And they're the least transport integrated region in the world. And that's because of disputes between Algeria and Morocco over the Western Sahara in part. So they're very vertically oriented. All three of these countries, they're not doing much horizontally between each other, which is bad for relations and the bad for the economy. But their main trade partner is France. And that's definitely true for Tunisia. Um, so there's, you know, there's historical grievance. There's resentment about French colonialism still. 
even though it was much more soft loved in Tunisia than it was in Algeria, where things got extraordinarily bloody. Um, but at the same time, France is Tunisia's most important international relationship. About 70% of, of Tunisia's trade is with France or, or the EU um, more broadly. So it's, it's a very important relationship. The most important ambassador in Tunisia is always going to be the French ambassador. That's still the case. And the French, the French are deeply, deeply concerned about Kaya Saïd. Not because he's brought back authoritarianism, because he's brought a sort of anti-Western, more pro-Russia, China, Gaddafi-esque, inefficient, kind of crazy town authoritarianism. Okay, once again, let me uh, ask for people to uh, contribute to this conversation, and uh, I'll be able to see as soon as you uh, raise a hand or ask a question. And I'm just going to ask you uh, a slightly difficult question, so because uh, you'll need just a couple of moments to think about it, probably. But you, you, how long did you live in Tunisia, did you say? Um, six years, and I've been going, I go back uh, every year for a couple months. What was your most joyous experience in Tunisia? What a great question, Owen. Oh, okay. Um, oh, one that's definitely up there. There was a New Year's Eve party when 2012 was becoming 2013. And it was at the home of a French journalist in La Marsa, which is one of these really nice suburbs of, of Tunis where the fancier people, people live. But the guests at this New Year's party at this French journalist flat were a lot of Tunisian revolutionaries. Um, including like these young leftist radicals who just chain smoked and they smelled disgusting. <laughs> you could smell them from like a mile away. Um, and I just remember we we all drank way too much. And I ended up dancing very close with people who smelled absolutely atrocious. <laughs> but what I remember so much about that night is um, the joy of the young revolutionaries and the hope that that we all had, despite the you know some G Tunisians joining the jihad in Syria and despite all the fragilities of the new, the new democratic regime it was a time of youth it was a time made by the young and to be in my 20s um i was doing my masters at oxford at the time and then i continued with my phd on both on tunisian politics to be of that moment with those young people who've been at the forefront of that revolution um it was just it was an extraordinary halcyon time period. And, and now, of course, in my more grisly <laughs> 30s, now after the presidential coup in Tunisia and so many of these people are back in prison and being persecuted, you know, I really, I, I look with a rosy tinged um, nostalgia at a night like that. And I remember what was possible. And I, you know, I just, I love Tunisia so much. Um, I'll never give up on it, no matter how depressing it gets. One of the shocking things I, I saw in Egypt at the time of the Arab Spring, where there were those squares, Tahrir Square and other places, full of those young revolutionaries, so excited and full of life and full of energy and creativity and hope. And then there was a restaurant, a very elite restaurant, right by Tahrir Square. And it was full of the children of the elite who actually weren't taking part in the protests at all. And you could see were were thrown off balance by them and, and didn't yeah. quite know whether basically their privileges were going to be sustained in yeah. a new political setup. And it was really shocking to me that you know, these very apparently westernized uh, elite uh, young Egyptians were not enjoying the revolutionary moment. They were fearing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have a lot, you have a lot to lose. <laughs> Right. And the people who have a lot to lose are are often a bit more conservatively oriented at moments of great change, or or they're looking, they're, they're trying to figure out how do I calibrate, how do I hedge my bets, how do I donate to all the people who might be able to screw me over, how do I make sure that I get some money outside if if I think that things are really going to um, go poorly. And there were a lot of people thinking like that at that moment. Um, there were also Jewish Tunisians, interestingly. Um, there's there's a small community of about 1,500 Jewish Tunisians um, who had their own reasons for fearing the revolution. Um, they were afraid that if Ennahda really was more like the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, was more Islamist and more Arab nationalist than it is, that would mean terrible things for them. And there were Israeli newspapers that um, you know would, would go to Tunisia um, and, and interview these people. And, 
ask them, are you afraid of an Islamist winter? Are you thinking about maybe moving to Israel to, to hedge your bets in a different way? And fascinatingly, I think shockingly to some, the democracy years were not bad for Tunisian Jews. Um, and it was, it, besides dictatorship, that's proven a lot worse, in, in part because Anatha really was so chill and so, and so moderate in a lot of ways. But Tunisia's small Jewish community, what's left of it now, um, finds itself living in an environment um, that's deeply, deeply conspiratorial, which is rarely good for Jewish people. Um, just to give you one example, the president, Kaya Syed, about a year ago, there was a storm in neighboring Libya, a terrible storm um, that killed um, a lot of people because a dam burst and it flooded. And it was called Storm Daniel. And the president, President Syed, said that it was a Zionist conspiracy that had made the storm because it's called Storm Daniel after a Hebrew prophet. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up, but the president of Tunisia, he, he's got deeply Arab nationalist and, and some might argue anti-Semitic um, conspiratorial flavorings. And, and there's a lot of reason for the Tunisian Jewish community to be worried. I know I kind of shoehorned that in, but I thought it might be interesting for your yeah. listeners, but given very, what's happening now. It's very interesting. Yeah. I'm just trying to think where else there is. I mean, if that community is still, that Jewish community in Tunisia is still a sort of viable community. I mean, in Yemen, I, I saw the Jewish community there and it was literally down to 200 people. You know, there, there was, yeah. it was they were living almost in a hotel, uh, care of the state, mm. the state's yeah. departments almost. And uh, many other places, uh, those communities have gone. Uh, so is would you say that that community in Tunisia, despite the history with the PLO, is one of the last remaining viable Jewish communities in the Middle East? It is, but the question of whether it's viable or not is the question. No. There aren't many people left. Um, when Tunisia got its independence from France in 1956, um, there were about 150,000 Tunisian Jews. It was actually a very large community, um, like Morocco's community. It was really big. Um, but the post-independence years weren't great. Um, Tunisians were made second-class citizens. They couldn't become presidents. Um, they were officially discriminated against. Um, of course, Israel's emergence as a state was connected to that too. Uh, you know, people people got very nationalist and very concerned about Jews being like an Israeli fifth column. So there was a mass migration uh, to to Israel, but also to Europe, to other countries. And if you go to Israel now, you know it's very easy to find Tunisian food <laughs> because of that. Uh, shakshuka, which is a Tunisian breakfast dish, is kind of claimed by Israelis too because Tunisian Jews brought it to Israel, and now it's part of the Israeli rich cultural culinary tapestry. So today, young young Tunisian Jewish friends of mine who are looking for a, a spouse, mm -hmm. not not a great dating market in Tunisia. You know, there are a few families who might have a son your age, and he might not be the the world's greatest. So you might want to go to France for the summer or to Israel and do your shopping. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of concern. Um, last year, there was um, the the big annual Jewish celebration in Tunisia, um, in the island of Jerba, which is down near Libya. There was a terrorist attack, um, an anti-Semitic terrorist attack at that um, festival that killed um, a couple people. And the president, Kaya Syed, did not call it an anti-Semitic attack. He did not travel down to Jerba to offer his condolences. And, you know, there's a lot of, of feeling in the Tunisian Jewish community that he didn't do that because he's not just an anti-Zionist. He's not just somebody critical of Israel, but he's got real issues with Jewish people. So the community has just been trying to keep its head down. You know, it's something that I would love to write about, but I struggle with figuring out how, because when you put light on this community, you can make them more vulnerable. So they're just trying to keep their heads down, not talk about it, um, and, and come up with plan Bs and Cs. But of course, a lot of them have Israeli family members who are saying, hey, now's, now's about time to come over. OK, uh, let me just bring in Howard, who's been looking up some trade figures. Howard. Great. <laughs> um, again, I, th this is Google, which is even more embarrassing than, than Wikipedia. But uh, I, I must say, I find the whole of this conversation absolutely fascinating. And uh, you know, to, to make real um, the, the, this country of, of Tunisia, which I've never visited, I, I mean, just in parentheses, uh, I did go to, to, to Libya about 20 years ago. And, and, and felt extremely uneasy uh, sort of walking down the street. I felt I, I stuck out and uh, a little mm -hmm. bit like you were saying, I, you, you just wonder, you know, did, did I make the right decision in coming here and, you know, am I going to get out again? The, the, my only other little anecdote there is that the only 
um, book on sale at the airport bookshop was lots of different versions of uh, Colonel Gaddafi's Little Green Book, but that's another story. So I was just sort of tapping away at the trade figures uh, as, as you were talking, and it would seem that the top three uh, trading partners of, of, of Tunisia are, are Italy, and the implication is that that's imports rather than exports, uh, and France, and of course China, with almost a, a, a nothing, as you say, uh, laterally with the uh, with the other North African countries. That does a little bit raise, raise the question of any comment about Italy, but certainly whether China is a player here at all. Mm. Great question. Thank you, Howard, um, because this brings two important threads into the conversation, Italy and China. So Georgia Maloney's Italy, and I'm sure your familiars are your, your listeners are familiar with Georgia Maloney. She's um, a right wing Italian politician who was elected a few years ago, and her obsession has been stopping migration over the Mediterranean Sea. And she'll work with anybody. She'll do any deal she needs to to stop that, which is which is understandable given her background in the Italian electorate, but it's led Italy to um, to prop up the Syed regime. Um, Georgia Maloney went on an international campaign to try to fundraise for Syed's dictatorship because he's been driving the economy over a cliff, as I was saying. So she basically, she came tin cupping to where I live, uh, Abu Dhabi, the UAE, a, a number of times, hoping that, um, to, to put it frankly, hoping that dumb golf money would would go to Syed because Italy doesn't have the money to bankroll his screw ups and and she doesn't want the country getting poorer and poorer and more people getting on little boats to go to Italy. Um, and the Saudis and the Emiratis, fascinatingly, even though they're no fans of the Arab Spring, they viewed the Arab Spring as highly destabilizing. They won't even use that term um, because for them it wasn't a spring; it was a threat to their to their regimes. So they were happy to see Tunisia's democracy die. But they feel that Syed is a very ineffective, confusing, highly ideological dictator, and, and they, they just have trouble um, talking to the guy. To, to give you an example, um, a couple of months after his coup in 2021, the Saudis sent a delegation from their finance ministry to basically ask Syed, what do you need? And Syed, instead of giving them his shopping list, he lectured them for like two or three hours about obscure figures from Islamic history. That's that's classic Zion. <laughs> um, he's a very esoteric kind of, you know, unsuccessful law professor who might have a few screws loose. That's that's his personality type, and he's very off-putting to potential backers. But Maloney was still determined to try to get EU money to Syed, to try to get golf money to Syed, and she's had limited success. Um, but she has a very cozy relationship with him, and. You know, I, th I think one thing Italy should be more concerned about that it's not concerned about is how ineffective and corrupt Syed's regime is makes it a difficult partner to work with um, in pursuit of limiting migration. Um, to give you one example, the Tunisian state, the Tunisian security forces have been implicated in human trafficking, in, in basically the buying and selling of black migrants and refugees across the border to militias in Libya, where there is a slave trade in black migrants and refugees and horrible, horrible human rights abuses. Um, but there's a, enough corruption in the Tunisian security apparatus and poor enough control from the top and Syed is so esoteric and distracted in his little world that you know, he, he's not taking control of the sector. So the, the European Union, especially Maloney, especially Italy, they look at Tunisia like like they looked at Turkey in 2016, and they want to do a money for migrants deal that they did with Erdogan. But the problem is Syed isn't Erdogan. He's not um, nearly as effective an autocrat. Um, to, to move to China. So, so Maloney is Syed's most important international relationship uh, at the moment, um, and really his key backer in the EU. And, and Maloney is the one who goes to more skeptical EU actors like Germany and the Netherlands and says how afraid she is about migration and tries to drum up support for Syed's regime as even though, you know, I think for a lot of experts like myself, we would say that's making the problem worse um, because because Syed is just so um, so esoteric and so ineffective. Um, China, one of the reasons why the United States and the EU players did not call his coup a coup when it happened and really didn't stand up for Tunisian democracy and human rights, to let those things die, um, was because they were afraid that China and Russia would move into that space. 
Um, I think that fear is overblown precisely because of the trade numbers you just read, Howard. Um, Tunisia is deeply, deeply dependent on vertical trade with the European Union, and it can't just overnight rejigger its economy um, to, to rely more on China or Russia, which, which gives the West a whole lot of leverage with Tunisia. Leverage that, in my opinion, in 2021, when side shut the democratically elected parliament with army tanks, it did not use effectively. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much. Um, we're coming towards the end of the hour, Monica. You're the most articulate uh, uh, spokesperson about uh, Tunisia. You really do uh, get through a lot Fine. of it. We're very grateful to you. I should just say that um, there are some tours coming up from political tours. Transdenistra. Well, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, oh, I want to go there. Transnistria. You guys yeah. are lucky. Uh, <laughs> United Ireland, which is a very good question, because uh, there is a lot of talk that we are closer to United Ireland than we've been for a very, very long time. Uh, and that is a discussion in British politics and in Irish politics, with people wondering uh, now whether they actually want it. Uh, Colombia and US elections. Uh, there are a number of tours. The island, I should say, there's only one place left. I think it, there was a cancellation. So if people are interested in that, they should be rapid. That's at the end of June, beginning of July. Uh, but Monica, thank you very much for guiding us through Thanks. Tunisia. It's been absolutely fascinating. And as I say, you're a brilliant speaker. So thank you very much. And from political tours in Anglesey in North Wales and in New York, goodbye.